Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is your professor, Dr. Nelson Garayas, uh, for MED 260 70AX. Um, and uh, this is the uh, topic one video, or week one video, regarding what do you need to do uh, for the week uh, and uh, what are the topics. So um, I have some notes here. Let me turn the editing off, that's annoying. My contact information here, of course, contact information inside the announcements here. Um, and uh, your textbook should be your medical assisting textbook. And um, my notes and uh, uh, these uh, the rubrics, which is like grading sheets, uh, because eventually uh, you will be uh, you'll need to come in for a lecture. But I believe we can do uh, history taking. Uh, via Zoom um, so that uh, we can uh, get your um, uh, some of your laboratory grades uh, via Zoom. Now uh, history taking it's important because um, this class is about tests and tests are based on the subjective or your, uh, your, your history of your patient and uh, the tests confirm what, uh, uh, what the physician or the NP already knows. So let's look at this history taking rubric and it'll give us uh, 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 some hints on how to, how to extract information from your patient. So the better information you can get from your patient, the, the better it'll give the, uh, the practicing clinician the idea on what tests to order. So the first thing is you have to use open-ended questions. You never ask yes and no questions. Because if you start asking yes or no questions, you, you're, you're, you're pigeonholing your patient to, uh, um, to say things that they don't really mean. Uh, and it, it becomes suggestive. Like if you ask a question like, um, did you have a fever? And then someone will go, well, I felt a little warm. And then, then uh, you know, it might mistakenly be written down as a fever. Open-ended questions like, how did you feel on that day? So what happened next? You let the patient talk, okay? Uh, and again, encourage the patient to verbalize their concerns. And you look at their response. You look at, you goes, you look at their facial expressions. You look at their pupils, especially when they're lying, right? And if you know they're lying, right? Again, once you chart it, you can't say patient was outright lying. They go, um, state, state only patient claimed. Patient claims this, patient claims that. Especially with uh, people with substance abuse, they always say stuff like, oh, I've been clean for 10 years, when they're obviously uh, uh, inebriated or on some sort of drug right in front of you. Patient states that uh, uh, he has been clean for the last 10 months, uh, uh, but then you, stay, then you state um, um, you know, all the other abnormalities in your physical examination and, and whatnot. So that yeah, now gives me fuel for, to order a toxicology report. Logi, study of, toxins, right? So we could see what kind of things that are in their system. And there's no things in their system, then we have to look at other things like a neurologic problem. After determining the specific problem, address it. And then, um, but don't latch onto it. There's this term in medicine called anchoring. You know, when, when the interviewer like latches onto a word, like, oh, I've, I had a bump in my neck. Oh, you have cancer. Then, then the interviewer starts answering, asking all these questions regarding cancer, right? Uh, if you have a specific problem, you focus on that, but then keep your mind open to anything that may potentially be related to the problem. And like I stated a little bit earlier, um, pay attention to the body language. Uh, and it goes back to your MED 140 class, right? You're not, you're not only recording what the patient says and does, you're also recording on if they're fidgeting, if they're, uh, if they're doing avoidance behavior, how, how is their body language? Is it closed? Is it open? Right? Uh, and you have to get your patient on their, uh, on your side because Many of the questions that we have to ask, especially about substance abuse, especially about uh, sexual orientation and, and sexual practices and things of that matter, uh, or 
you know, it, it's kind of, um, it's embarrassing. And also, it might make your, your it might make your patient upset. Uh, and again, do not challenge your patient. So if if your patient says, he goes, well, the dragons talk to me. You know, don't giggle, don't go, what dragons? You will now be challenging the patient. And if you challenge, especially if the patient is violent due to substance abuse or they're psychotic, osis, abnormal uh, condition of the mind, right? They could easily turn violent very, very quickly, right? Uh, practice your uh, safety measures that you learned in MED 140. If you do not recall them, give me a call and I could, I'll relay them to you. Things like, uh, if you feel uncomfortable, don't interview alone. If you um, uh, uh, you leave uh, you leave the door open, make sure make sure your patient isn't blocking you from exiting. If you feel that there are signs and symptoms of aggression, you terminate the interview and you and you leave, right? And recognize recognize the signs and symptoms and be empathetic and 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 pay attention to your patient. Many times uh, that I've gotten in trouble uh, with a patient is because I didn't pay attention to, this, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the warning signs, right? And then, uh, and then I started interjecting my own emotion and then uh, things can be bad, okay? Again, do not handle the patient alone. You leave the room, just leave, right? And then of course, document it on the chart. Patient was belligerent, patient stood up, patient closed distance on me, I felt uncomfortable, I left the room, I informed my chain of command. Now, child is fun and funny uh, and interesting because a child, um, here's a classic uh, in pediatrics. You, you go, where is it hurt? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, and you point at the tummy, does it hurt here? Yes. Where else does it hurt? And they're like, and they point at their head. Does your head hurt? No. Where does it hurt? My hair. So you can see how you can get some bizarre answers out of a child. So ask questions, right, from the viewpoint of the child and know and understand that the child is also scared. Um, you may have heard of, about white coat syndrome, right? Uh, of course, anybody in a white uniform, the person who gave them the shot, that's the person who uh, the child is going to have some phobias with or even the adult. Right. Uh, utilize the guardian, the person who uh, the person who came in uh, um, uh, with your uh, pediatric patient. Uh, confirm the patient's answers and then uh, allow uh, al allow translation from the guardian. But again, be careful because uh, the guardian also could be anchor anchoring. Oh, doc, I definitely know it's I definitely know it's uh, uh, an infection when it could it, it could be something else. And then, of course, everything is all about uh, documentation. Make sure you document it on the chart. Okay. Now, when you're writing in progress in notes or when you're writing on the computer, even though the computer has, um, if you've ever been to a hospital, or maybe some of you will work uh, in some of these places, the, the laptop that they have or the computer that they have, especially nowadays, uh, nowadays they have this like, um, uh, like, like film or covering over the keyboards because keyboards are one of the dirtiest th places in the world. Uh, take your keyboard, tip it over and, uh, tap it a couple of times. You will see all the skin, nails, dirt, crumbs. There's a lot of disgusting things in there. And, um, and also, uh, remember that, uh, that transmission could also be, uh, uh, through physical touch and what is everyone touching everyone's touching that keyboard so of course do your asepsis and when you're handling notes and charts uh, um, have asepsis in mind and uh, when uh, when you are uh, inter like when we have this mock interview where you're gonna interview me um, um, about my um, about my illness or whatnot Make sure to always identify yourself. Always greet yourself. I hate that when a medical professional comes in, goes, and then starts talking to me. I don't know who you are. I can't read your badge from across the room. You come in and say, hi, good morning. My name is Nelson. I'm your medical assistant today. Um, Dr. Cassidy wanted me to, um, to ask you some questions. Is that all right with you? Do you see how in that short little spiel, I'm able to do what? 
clearly identify who I am, clearly identify the goals, and um, uh, um, ask permission or garner consent. And these are the things that you need to do uh, prior to uh, get, uh, getting a history from your patient. Note the chief complaint. What's the real reason why they are there? How many times I've had patients, you know, after you talk to them, they're like, oh, I came in because my, my, my stomach hurts. And then after you talk to them for a little while, it's actually anxiety. They came in because they're feeling anxious, right? And that anxiety is making their stomach hurt. So the stomach pain is not the chief complaint. The chief complaint is the anxiety and uh, the stomach ache and the headaches and, and uh, uh, the insomnia are all uh, signs and symptoms uh, uh, of this anxiety. Now remember, a sign is how a patient feels. A symptom is something that, I mean, sorry, scratch, rewind. A sign is something that we can all see. For example, if you have a fever we all go, and you took a picture of your thermometer or took a video of the thermometer, right, which is super plausible nowadays now that everyone has a smartphone or most of everyone has a smartphone, that is a sign. You see it, I see it, we all understand it. But a symptom is, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling some stomach, uh, stomach pain. I don't know uh, what that pain is. So that pain is highly subjective. So that's a symptom. It's how a patient feels. And pain from one person to another person is very, very different. Especially ladies, if you've had a child, pain to you is nothing anymore because you had the greatest pain that anyone could ever have. And a male patient won't understand that. All right. So uh, these are the things to take, in, take into consideration as well. Progress notes have to be filled in chronicle or, uh, chronicle, chronological order with the chief complaint being first, right? And then the history of present illness, and I'm reviewing hopefully the stuff that you went over in MED 140, is the history of present illness is everything regarding that issue. Let's take the issue of the anxiety. So I'll be asking my patient, so when did this uh, pressure or, or this, uh, your, uh, um, uh, you know, your feeling of worry or doom start? Well, it started six days ago when, uh, you know, when my mom really got sick and, and she was COVID positive. Okay, so now the history has to do deal with what happened six days prior to consultation and then it's got to work its way back until current day. Okay, then why are you seeing us today? Because, well, my stomach pain ha started happening on Monday. Now it's Thursday. Now it's really, it's really getting to me, Doc, and uh, that's what brought me in. So the chief complaint is the anxiety. The history of present illness is six days prior to consultation. The, uh, the patient, uh, um, patient's mother was um, diagnosed COVID positive and for maybe, maybe, maybe three days because it was Monday, right? Three days prior to consultation, the patient had progressive uh, stomach pain, left upper quadrant uh, uh, where the pain was significant enough which prompted today's consultation. That's now all of that I said took a while to learn how to do, but um, uh, for MED 140 in this class, we're going to try to teach you the basics of it to help to help you guide your way to, through something like that. So, and then at the very very end, thank the patient. Say thank you, thank you for opening up to me because this is personal stuff, and the doctor will be with you, and I'm going to convey everything that you said to me to the doctor. And of course, what do you do before and after every patient? You wash your hands. Now, the previous CDC regulations stated that you could use um, um, hand sanitizer if you're not doing anything invasive, but they, that may change now that uh, asepsis is ramped up a notch due to um, uh, due to the current uh, current uh, protocols. But as of right now, as of your textbook, as of my knowledge. Regarding uh, what uh, what they still do in hospitals, well, nowadays everything now is virtual. But um, um, make sure to uh, at least sanitize your hands before and after every patient, um, uh, because you don't want to risk cross contamination. Even if you're just taking uh, uh, taking down. Um, you know, taking down information and taking down information chart. And definitely you'll be touching a computer screen or you'll be touching a, um, a, a keyboard, even though the keyboard has that, um, um, that biohazard cover on it still, uh, that's, that's proper aseptic technique, even to this day. 
Um, medical history. Do, 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 do. Did we do that? And here's some other uh, other things uh, that, of course, uh, all the information. And I think I have a sample of the questionnaire and everything to fill out. But typically, patients fill out all these things now uh, prior. Now, the other thing is to make eye can contact, right? Really get into what your, 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 your patient is saying. And I know sometimes it's hard to remember everything, but after a while, it's better to listen and then take then jot notes. Because if you have your head, uh, we had a medical assistant uh, a year ago who uh, she was taking down notes diligently, but she wasn't making eye contact. And then it got to the point where the patient said, are you even paying attention to me with your head in your book? And she said, excuse me? And she got, and the patient got really upset. Um, but that's a good learning point, right? Make eye contact. And, you know, do that thing that you, you do. And, of course, be genuine about it. You know, when you're really listening, you know, you nod your head. And every every couple of words or so, um, do, remember your techniques from MED 140? Mirroring. So, like, whatever the, the, the story of the patient is, like summarize it, paraphrase it, give it back to them and mirror what they say and see if it comes back the same way. And if it comes back the same way, that's where you get your confirmation from. Okay, again, open-ended uh, documentation. Now, uh, regarding answering questions, be wary of your level of uh, training and education. Okay, do not answer any questions regarding any previous lab results or diagnoses you always refer it back to the doctor and tell them outright i am not allowed to talk to you about that i don't have any in or i always say i don't have any information on that let me ask the doctor about that that's how i always deal with it even though i know oh your biopsy is positive but i am not allowed to say that that is the doctor's or the np's job to do that uh, your job as a medical assistant or um uh, um, you know, um, novice, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, clinician, uh, is to take down and properly convey and document uh, the information at hand, okay? And if you have any red flags or anything, uh, know your office policy. Make sure to inform your, uh, uh, your physician and your chain of command immediately if anything, like things like, like I mentioned earlier, psychosis. Like, Doc, the guy really thinks I'm an alien, and he's seeing stars and spaceships not right now. That's, that's a bad thing, okay? Or your, your patient, uh, they're dizzy, she almost fainted, uh, and she's complaining of uh, substernal chest pain, doctor. Um, you tell that right now. I remember when I was a medical assistant, my patient was having chest pain and dyspnea, and I just moved on to the next patient. Instead of informing my chain of command, hey, she's in trouble. I was like, yeah, they'll get to her. Just imagine if they didn't, they didn't see her immediately and they make her wait inside the, um, uh, the examination room and then she coded, how much trouble would I be in, right? Because you remember, you're part of the team and, and many times you're the first line of defense and you're, you're the eyes and ears of the NP and the MD. And uh, many times, the medical professional may or may not even know their name. Oh, that's another thing that's on here. Address them by name. And if you cannot pronounce the name, ask how it's pronounced and legitimately try to learn how it's pronounced. Because when you use somebody's name and you be more personal and take the time to read the chart and, uh, uh, and to be personal and to have, that, uh, to have the true, uh, um, genuine care, especially on days where you don't feel like caring, because that's our job. Okay, so uh, this rubric is really nice because it outlines and, and, and reviews a lot of really great main points regarding uh, um, how to do history taking. Now, we'll do, here are, here is some notes from my MED 140 class. Let's see, uh, let's see, oh, here it is. So, Part and parcel of how we get good laboratory results is you have to make sure that uh, they, your aseptic technique is uh, um, uh, good in the room because many times we 
uh, not only in the room, many doctors' offices, private doctors' offices, have these little mini testing, like in between the rooms or maybe in a separate room. So, uh, knowing the layout of a typical examination room, knowing where all the equipment is, uh, will help you. Like uh, if you're starting off uh, at a new facility, uh, when I was a medical assistant, and um, uh, when I was an office manager, I would always ask. Uh, new nurses or new medical assistants or new clinicians. Hey, uh, do you want uh, uh, do you want to take a, uh, take an extra day just to you know get the lay of the land? How many people said no? I'm all right. I've I've done this before. And then on the first day, like uh, where are the tongue depressors? Where are the uh, ten cc syringes? So get to know. I go, I, it seems mundane that um, that you need to know about the furnishings and and but it's more important about where where things are so you can be more efficient um, uh, when you are in uh, in an office. Um, ADA accessibility. If you're taking the and I'm not quite sure if these pages are accurate, but uh, you can also look them up in your textbook regarding ADA accessibility. Again, a nice little review from MED 140. Know know what ADA is. Uh, know the requirements of it all because that is an important topic in uh, your, um, uh, and I highly promote uh, you taking your uh, medical assisting boards or your registry exam, that's a better way to put it. Know the levels of asepsis. Uh, we're gonna need to know that regarding, uh, because we're gonna be doing a little bit of uh, um, uh, minor surgery prep, and minor surgery prep, especially for biopsies, you need to know how to prepare all the equipment for a biopsy and I can't contaminate that biopsy. Imagine you have cancer, you're, you are, or how's this? Imagine a loved one has cancer and then I have to go back to you like, oh, the, the, the sample got contaminated, we're gonna have to take it again. And then you have to wait another three to four days for your results. And on top of that, you have to come back in and I have to poke you with a needle or I have to cut you up, uh, uh, cut a little bit out of you again. That That is, not good uh, customer service, that is not good patient service. And so you really need to know uh, these things. There's three levels, sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization. Um, they are levels, so for example, to get the sterilization, which is the autoclave that uses pressure and heat, either pressure or and or heat, you have to go through all the steps. So the first step is always sanitization. You scrub it and you have to scrub it in a neutral pH solution and um, you're always separating your equipment. And also remember how to handle your equipment. When we go to laboratory, I will show you how not uh, to handle equipment. And these levels I did a ton because I used to be a medical assistant in a um, orthopedics office. So uh, we did a lot of, um, you know, uh, we did a, a lot of, um, uh, as sepsis because we're always doing minor surgeries and little uh, little touch-ups here and there inside the office. Um, so it's always sanitization first and ultrasound is part of uh, that level. Maybe you've seen uh, the UV slash ultrasound cleaning uh, for um, <coughs> maybe, <coughs> excuse me, in a dentist office. That's... Um, um, uh, uh, that is at the level of sanitization. Sanitization is the low, lowest level of asepsis. And remember, asepsis, A means no or not. Sepsis means state or condition of uh, infection or state of condition of uh, foreign body or state of condition of uh, some sort of pathology. You will never get to the level of absolutely no bacteria, absolutely zero life forms because life always finds a way. But we can get it really close and that's the level of sterilization. The next level, so level one, sanitation, uh, sanitization. Level two, disinfection. That's when we start using the antiseptics and disinfections. There's a table uh, in your textbook, look up antiseptics and disinfectants. I'm gonna also look up to see if these pages are still good. Uh, and if they are not, I'll, I'll update you. But there's, uh, you can look up on your textbook and uh, or you can just Google it, what are the antiseptics and disinfectants that we use? And there's certain disinfectants that you use on certain material, okay? Uh, not all of it applies to uh, rubber, all of, not all of it applies to uh, metal, 
Okay, so uh, be careful. There are certain disinfectants that you shouldn't put together because then you have a really bad chemistry set. And lastly, sterilization in laboratory. We'll go, we'll go over the autoclave uh, and the autoclave procedures and we'll run a batch just to, you know, to, uh, just to get you guys warmed up. Hand hygiene, we already went over. When can you use hand sanitizers? And remember, this might change because of the current uh, um, COVID uh, CDC guidelines. But as of right now, the guidelines uh, uh, still apply. If it's, um, of course, where you don all of your PPE, and nowadays even not only the, the mask, face shields as well, especially if your patient it has, uh, has a recent history of lower respiratory tract infection and or if they are actively coughing or sneezing, right? Um, uh, clean surfaces, uh, what disinfectants we use, what do we use for blood spills? So uh, Google or get answers of this, uh, of these things, how to properly remove examination pa uh, uh, paper so as to not get it on you uh, because remember, um, uh, the current virus is a uh, direct contact. So if your patient is lying on that paper, that's direct contact. And back to the hand sanitizers, if it's non-invasive, yes, you can use hand sanitizers. But if you're doing an invasive procedure, uh, you have to do you have to do your hand washing protocols and review your hand washing and how to hand wash. And last but not least, uh, we're gonna um, um, instrument identification. Yeah, uh, for this class, good to know, nice to know. Uh, but we're more concentrating on uh, these three things up here and the autoclave. All right. So, um, okay, I also have some history taking notes here as well. And uh, they should match up with uh, some of the stuff that we talked about in the rubric. Let's look at that. Okay. Now, this is a review of SOAP or SOAP notes. Okay. And if you, I hope you had this in MED 140, but I can't guarantee it because I, uh, since I'm a medical guy, um, I'm a clinician, uh, this is my life. And well, it's a lot of people's lives, but. SOAP notes stand for Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. And your subjective, like I mentioned earlier, is your uh, what the your subject. What is the story of your subject, which is uh, your patient? And your patient, can they be lying? Sure. Can they be exaggerating something? Sure. Can they be not in the right mental state? Sure. Right? But it goes, these are the things that we, uh, we have to take with a grain of salt. So we also take the subjective portion of our history taking with a, uh, with a grain of salt. So what's in, what's in the subjective part? Of course, the history, chief complaint. It should be in the patient's own words. So remember, um, uh, I, I told you that the patient was feeling anxiety. That's my words. But if the patient said, you know what, I've been feeling pressure, you know, on my face and on my, my stomach. So that's the patient's chief complaint, pressure. I feel pressure, right? And what's the main reason to come in, in here? I go, I go, well, I feel pressure, and then I got this stomach ache, and that's what prompted me to come in here. History of present illness, I already went over. Consultation uh, regarding the chronological history of, and it has to relate to the chief complaint. PMH is past medical history, anything, surgeries, hospitals, admissions, and uh, uh, especially uh, allergies. How many times I've had a patient, no, I don't have any allergies, that's NKA, no known allergies. And then the next thing you know, oh, I forgot, I'm allergic to penicillin. And you're like, oh, dang it, I just gave him penicillin. Social history, that's hard to ask. That's, the, that's everything you do at a party or a really bad party. So bad or good, depending how you look at it. Drinking, smoking, illegal drug use, sexual orientation and practices, that's rough. Uh, that, so this is delicate. And, and be respectful and, and, and try to use as, um, uh, the best medical terms and the, or the simplest terms as possible. Um, review of systems. Now, the review of systems is this checklist. If you've ever been to the doctor's office, now, remember I said earlier, like, 
uh, you really shouldn't ask uh, yes or no questions. Well, the review of systems is a yes or no checklist. And they, the, what the review of systems does is it, it, sees, it sees if there's any other semi-unrelated items that may or may not pertain to your chief complaint. So we're looking at anything extra because how many times I found a patient has diabetes, heart condition, and all these other things from my ROS. Uh, so I'll, of course, deal with the person's chief complaint, but I also have to deal with any other problems that may or may not be associated with the chief complaint. Okay. Of course, patient's rights. The pay, uh, know your patient's bill of rights. You can look that up. And that's, um, uh, uh, that's that little pink or, or bright red um, um, paper that you have the, uh, the patient sign. Um, when they first come to the office and so it makes them understand that in order for me to help you uh, they have it goes uh, they have to divulge certain things and to know that I will keep these these anything that we talk about safe and remember that's also part of HIPAA uh, we talked about mirroring be clear, beware of nonverbal cues uh, guarding is guarding is when you um, the patient you're doing palpation or you're touching the patient and the patient starts doing what? You know, starts covering up that area. Uh, they may not show pain on their face, but that's called guarding. They, they want to guard that area because it hurts. Grimacing is you're making a face or you wrinkle your forehead a little bit uh, because something hurts or something bothers you. Either lack or excessive eye contact uh, could be an issue. Remember, human beings, we like being in the middle. And uh, if... Too much eye contact, too little eye contact is uh, is of concern. And you'll know that feeling. In psychiatry, is called your pre-cox feeling. That's uh, C-O-X, um, short for cognitive. You ever met somebody and you know something's wrong? You can't put a finger on it, but maybe it's the way they look at you or the way they talk to you, but you know something's wrong. Uh, it goes, um, that's... It goes, uh, uh, that's... Uh, something that you should be aware of that 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 you especially the more once you get a broad uh, knowledge broader knowledge base and once you uh, see more patients you start uh, figuring some of this stuff out and you start experiencing and seeing things uh, uh, um, seeing the bigger picture seeing uh, all the problems and what are the problem which is the most pertinent problems to the least pertinent problems uh, always read the chart always garner consent always ask, hey, is it okay if I talk to you? And then, like, you know, they nod their head, yeah, sure. And it goes, okay, great. And if they don't want to talk to you, have your canned answer ready. Don't go, uh, 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 you know, because you do, um, uh, uh. You know, it shows your naivete, and it also shows that you're a novice. But if you say, hey, he goes, he goes I see that your chief complaint's really bothering you. He goes, we're here to help you. And I can't, I goes, the doctor can't help you until I get this history from you. So let me get this history from you so I can take it to the doctor so we, so you can get what you need, right? And you're making the patient feel at ease. Uh, speak to them at their level, not only visually, but also uh, education-wise. Do not use medical terminology just to make yourself look smart. Use terminology when it's warranted. So if you're speaking to a nurse, speak to them like a nurse. If you're speaking to because if you're speaking to somebody who has no idea what any of the medical terms are, speak to them like a normal human being, right? And just say like instead of saying myocardial infarction, well, you had a heart attack. Okay, the doctor wanted me to tell you you had a heart attack, and a heart attack is, and then you explain it like a like a normal person. Heart attack, a piece of your heart got blocked, and your heart needs oxygen, uh, and it didn't get that oxygen, so a piece of your heart got damaged. And that's what we're looking at today. So he goes, and speaking in that tone makes the uh, patient feel more at ease. And there's, uh, and I already mentioned bureau sensitive topics. And look at this table. Look at one of your tables in your textbook regarding. There's a uh, there's a part there on uh, like how to make your uh, how to how to make your patient feel more at ease and how to. Um, Make your, uh, you know, make your patient trust you in the short amount of time that you have to garner that trust. Because think about it, in the 15 minutes you have to have this interview, you could be doing something gosh awful and gosh painful 
to your um, um, to your um, what do you call it to your patient so this history time this subjective time is very very important to garner that trust I said the word garner a lot gain how's that let's use in other ones documentation knows the six 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 C's of charting conciseness completeness again a review of MED 140 uh, know what's in the chart um, and SOAP applies to all electronic medical records uh, all the tabs in all the electronic medical records fall into that category is it subjective does it deal with the patient's history is it objective does it deal with the physical examination and or um, uh, uh, laboratories which is the bulk of this class does it deal with a the assessment or the diagnosis or P does it deal with the plan what meds are they going to be on what consultations they're going to be needing okay and there's other uh, forms of uh, uh, SOAP but uh, SOAP is uh, the most common now know your abbreviations in general uh, and last but not least how do you assess pain and that's the PQRST method now the PQRST method let's look at that too lazy to go into the uh, book let's look at the assessment of PQRST uh, A little bit old school but it still works if I was still practicing to this day it's it's something that I would still look up that's if it would let me look it up uh, no we can barely see that okay let's look at this it's a little bit clearer here now, PQRSD stands for Provoke, Quality, Radiation, Severity, and Timing. So if you ask a patient regarding pain, right, you have to ask what provoked or precipitated it, what brought it on, okay, if something brought it on. If nothing, then it was unpredictable and it just came, it was very acute and it came out of nowhere. Quality, was it, now quality is Typically, was it a stabbing pain, like a knife, like sharp, or was it dull? You know, like uh, like being hit with, like, you know, um, a telephone book. Right? I don't know why I chose that example. <laughs> Radiation. Did the pain stay in one place, or did it move around? Severity. Now, be careful with severity, because you can now see how, in history, it's very subjective. Again, if you're a mother of three or two or one, right, uh, or if you're a woman in general, uh, your level, your threshold of pain is quite high. But if you're a guy like me, it is quite low, right? So when you ask a patient uh, from a scale from one to ten, ten being the worst, and you could see here, there's a, you could maybe see this on charts, one, you're good, but then ten, the worst pain of your life. Right? Uh, you usually get it from a scale of 1 to 10, and 10 being the worst. And timing, when did it happen? Uh, so when did it start? When did it go away? Did it go away by, like, uh, uh, and how did it go away? Because part of provoke is palliation. Palliation means how did it go away. Oh, I had a tummy ache, but you know, when I started rubbing my tummy, it kind of went away, and that's palliation. So that's PQRST. That's history taking. Now, let's go over what you need to do to uh, get attendance this week and what you need to do to um, uh, get grades for this week. So, watching the video and all that, uh, uh, attending the Zoom, uh, please uh, um, do the quiz. And all you have to do is just click on it and then answer the quiz and do the discussion. Um, and uh, the discussion is how does a clinician deal with a patient who is obviously lying how do we document this without sounding biased against our patient make sure that you post at least 200 words and correct spelling and grammar be sure to support your claims via APA formatted academic uh, what is that word current sources so what I mean by current sources 
is something legit from .org, .gov, .edu, something within the last five years. Um, especially when you're talking about technology, you, add, you, you post something from 10 years ago, think about it this way. Look at your phone from 10 years ago. It's, it's ancient history compared to uh, your phone currently or any of your electronic and uh, technological advances currently. So we're in, we're in a scientific field, so um, that's, uh, uh, that's, the important, that's the important part. All right, so that is uh, the first week's lecture. Okay, and I'll, since it's kind of a, a little bit longer than 15 minutes, I'm probably gonna do it as a YouTube link, uh, and I'm gonna put that in uh, the announcement section uh, shortly, probably, and it's uh, now 10.29 a.m. on a Thursday, um, I'll probably, uh, it probably should be play, put in by 12 noon today. And please get, uh, um, um, get some of, uh, get some of this material, uh, to me as soon as possible so I can, uh, garner attendance. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll talk to you next week.